Hi, I'm Reverend Greg and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In this video we'll continue with learning to blur an image. But as always, a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths. So if you see any mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. In the last videos we first created a horribly inefficient single pass blur shader, then improved the performance a lot by blurring in two passes. After that we improved it further by using the GPU's linear texture filter and finally we added another major boost by scale blurring in multiple render passes. So by now we should have a pretty good understanding of how blurring works and how we can change the way things get blurred dynamically. But what if we don't need to change blur steps or sigma? What if we just need one static blur size? Why let the fragment shader calculate weights and offsets then? As we have seen in the first video on blurring, those calculations do cost some performance and we need to control and pass in uniforms. So in today's video we'll create a static hard-coded blur shader and you'll see it's the easiest of all because of a neat little tool we're going to utilize. So this is what a static fragment shader looks like. There's some room for optimization but not by much anymore. We're looking at the code of a one-dimensional blur shader with linear interpolated sample offsets fully scalable for scale blurring and usable for both a vertical and a horizontal pass. The kernel size is 9x9. We can see all these statements I just made in the code and as an exercise let's just do that. It's kind of a short summary of what we learned in the last few videos. There are 9 samples taken, so the kernel size is 9. The middle line is the sample on the fragment we're calculating. The four lines above are taking samples either to the left or above the current fragment. We can see that because in those lines something is subtracted from VV text chord. The four lines below the middle line are taking samples either to the right or below the fragment since something is added to VV text chord. The uniform texel size lets this shader be scalable because we can pass in different texel sizes for different surface sizes. The uniform blur vector lets this shader be used for a horizontal and a vertical pass because it's a vec2 and it's multiplied with the offsets of VV text chord. And it can't just be a discrete sample blur or the offsets would be minus 5 times texel size, minus 4 times texel size, minus 3, minus 2 and so on. But instead, the distance from offset to offset is always something larger than 1 and smaller than 2, and the difference decreases the farther from the center we are. So it has to be a blur using linear interpolated samples. But enough of that, let's dive right into coding now. To start, I'll create a new shader and call it Shader Blur 2 Pass Gauss Lerp Hardcoded. Then I'll duplicate the object from the last video, which was called Object Blur 2 Pass Gauss Lerp Scaled. Name it Object Blur 2 Pass Gauss Lerp Hardcoded Scale. And place it on the main layer of our test room. In create event, I once more quickly replace the info text. And set the shader to the newly created one. Now since blur steps and sigma are going to be hard coded, we can just remove both handles. But everything else can stay as it is. The cleanup event can stay the same as well. We still want the surfaces to be freed in the end. Same goes for the draw GUI event. All we do here is draw the base project's model, frame and text. We can delete the code inside the draw event. We just use that to demonstrate the flickering when blur scaling and we don't need to demonstrate that again. In draw GUI begin event, where all our post-processing code is, we need to change or rather simplify quite a lot. 
First of all, I don't plan to draw all the info text on kernel size and so on. And we won't need blur steps, kernel size and sigma, since that's all hard-coded inside the fragment shader. So let's just remove all of it. All local vars on top of the code block except the local var lerp is enabled. And everything for the string creation at the end. We'll still need the surface creation and resize code so we can use surface scaling to blur with smaller kernels. And we still want to set the texture filter. The first pass, the downscaling of the application surface, stays the same. In the second pass, where we blur horizontally, we can remove the two uniforms for blur steps and sigma. And the third pass, where we blur vertically, as well as the fourth pass, where we draw the result upscaled to the screen, can stay as they are. And so can the texture filter setting in the end. And that's it already for the object. Now for the fragment shader. Now this seems to be tricky. The shader code is very simple and straightforward. But how would we calculate all those offsets and weights? The answer is really simple. We don't need to calculate them at all. We can just use a blur calculator to do that for us. And to keep it even simpler, I created one you can use as well. A download link is in the description below this video. And this is what the calculator looks like. At the top we can set sigma and kernel size. To the right of that we can choose between discrete sampling and linear interpolated sampling. On the right side we can see a preview of the blur effect in a photo and above that preview window we can set the scale factor. Now the scale factor won't change the shader code since we'll keep that dynamic with a uniform texel size. It's just used as a preview setting. In the main part of the calculator we see a preview of the shader code. You can scroll with the mouse wheel and drag with the left mouse button. You'll even see a preview of the shader header here. The bars behind the code display the current kernel. Note what changes when we change kernel size, sigma and blur type. Sigma flattens the kernel weights. If a sample is too close to zero, we're going to waste resources. And if the farthest sample is too much above zero, we'll lose smoothness. The green and red colors are just indicators, though. You should still try to get the best visual result by checking the photo preview. The kernel size changes the kernel, and the number of bars in the main window represent the number of samples taken in the kernel. Changing the type from discrete to linear shows two things. First, Linear blurring takes less samples. That much was obvious anyways. And second, in linear blurring, the highest weight is not on the central sample. Looks weird, but it's logic since that's the only discrete sample. All other samples are taken between two texels to get the color of both texels and thus have the weight of two texels. On the top left we can display an information overlay and to the right of the info button we can set what is shown in the main window. Code and graph, just a graph, or just a code. And the last part is the copy buttons. Here we can copy the fragment shader code as seen in the main window. Or just the weights as constant GLSL arrays. and the object code as we programmed it early in this video. So let's pick a nice setting, copy the shader code, and return to GameMaker Studio. Here we can just paste the code into our fragment shader and run the program. And as you can see, this works. The sliders won't change anything anymore though. It's always the same kernel and sigma. The only thing that stays dynamic is the scaling with its upside of being a tremendous performance boost and its downside of flickering. But let's repeat that once more. 
We'll pick a new setting in the blue calculator, copy the code, paste it into our fragment shader, and run this again. Simple. All I'd like to do before we end this video is mention some possible improvements to this shader. If you don't scale blur, and the surface to blur will always be of the same size, then you can replace texel size with hard-coded values or actually calculate them right into the offsets. If you create one shader for a horizontal pass and one for a vertical pass, you could also get rid of the uniform blur vector, make texel size a float, and only offset the X or the Y coordinate. Of course, there's other possible minor optimizations, but I thought none of them really worth it. So you see, hard-coded blurs are really easy. The only difficulty is calculating the offsets and weights, but that can be done by a calculator. If you like this tutorial series, please subscribe, give a thumbs up to each video and add a comment once in a while for visibility on search engines so everyone who wants to learn more about shaders can find this series easily. So that's it for this video. I'll add a second repetition video before going on with the next lesson where we'll finally get something useful out of all this blurring by creating a glow or bloom shader. Until next time.